Hello and good morning, MYM Insiders. How's everybody doing today? This is Rich Harshaw, and we're here for our tactical marketing webinar today. And we're going to talk about mining some gold out of the existing customer database. This is an area where a lot of people really don't put a lot of time and attention. Now, I'm going to approach this from a general standpoint with uh, general information that will, um, that will work for lots of different kinds of companies, but understanding that the majority of those of you on here are modelers, I'll spend some time and uh, focus in specifically on that as well. So that being said, uh, let's go ahead and jump in and get moving on this. I don't think we need a lot of preamble. Let's get right to the meat and to the potatoes. All right, let's make sure our technology is working okay. And it is. All right, so we've got three kinds of past customers we want to talk about. And uh, your company could be a combination of these, depending on what kinds of things that you sell. One-shot sales. If you sell something that's bigger and doesn't really lend itself that well to another purchase, if you're in the sunroom business, that probably describes you. I don't know a lot of people that come back and put a second sunroom on their house, although, obviously, some people might move and then uh, want a sunroom on a second house that they buy. Ongoing possibility. Companies that lend themselves to repeat business, but customers not bound by a contract or service agreement. So this would be uh, a home improvement company that has multiple types of products or services, or any other kind of company where there's not a contract involved. And then uh, we've also got something called operation recovery. Customers that used to buy from you regularly but then quit, and they need to be reengaged. So we'll cover all three of these in today's webinar. Let's talk about one-shot sales first, okay? And again, things that don't lend themselves to buying again very soon, home improvement, home builders. I bought a home. I built a home. It's been over 10 years now and uh, just don't go back to that well very often. <laughs> Realtors, title companies, pianos, hot tubs, ATVs, things like that, larger ticket items that you just don't buy all the time, even things that are more common like automobiles, electronics, computers, and so forth, okay? Most companies feel like since the, on the likelihood of buying again is small, they're really not going to go after this kind of business. And you know, th there's some validity to that, but I think, uh, as you'll see as we go through this, that that's probably making a pretty big mistake, okay? So here's the case for ongoing marketing. So first thing, it's a larger product, larger purchase item, so there's more allowable marketing cost per sale. In other words, the amount of money that you can afford to spend to get a new customer is larger. So that gives you more money then to continue to market to that customer for the second uh, or subsequent purchase. Okay? And uh, also you need to keep in mind that some things that seem impossible to repurchase actually can be repurchased. Swimming pools might need resurfacing services if that's something that's also offered by the company. But again, people do move. The average number of years people live in a given place is seven. And obviously that is subject to all kinds of different variables and situations. But if it's true, then people may need your services again in the future. Hold on just one minute. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Some things are repurchased every so often. Things like cars and computers do have a life cycle that needs to be um, taken into account. If you buy an automobile, I mean, it just kind of depends on where you're at in the life cycle of your family. I'm at a point in my family where I've got a 21-year-old son and an 18-year-old daughter and a 16-year-old son, and I've got a 13-year-old son. So we've got an ongoing need for automobiles. I like to update my car about every, I don't know, three to five years, something like that. My wife on that same schedule, so there's a there's an opportunity there for ongoing computers, same kind of thing. I, I don't know about you, but I uh, get so tired of my computer and I want to destroy it about every one to three years, probably about two and a half years is more like the average. So there's some uh, 
need to do that kind of thing. The margins are good, so you need to be concerned about referrals. Hang on, I get just a little bit of an audio problem here. I'm going to fix that. Okay. Hopefully everybody can still hear me. And uh, so let's talk about how to execute this. First thing, put all of your past customers. Th this is pretty simple stuff. I'm not saying you couldn't have thought of this yourself, but you need to think about this yourself. Put your customers into a standard email and or mailing hopper. And I'm going to recommend that you put together a mailing hopper and send people stuff, at stuff, send people stuff at least once per quarter. Now you could have a little discussion here about do you really need to mail if you're emailing. My experience with email is that a lot of it does not get through. And the good thing about mail is that 100% of it will get through. Now will the right person see it? Will they instantly throw it away? All of those questions are in play, but at least it will get through. There, I mean, there's just a lot of email that just does not get looked at. Also, if you send an email to a customer um, monthly, they're going to do one of a couple things. I mean, let's just face it. Let's say that you sell sunrooms or you sell siding or something like that. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to like you. They're going to think that your service was good, but in their mind, it's over. It's done. They're not really thinking about it much anymore, no matter how much they liked you. And when that email comes in, after a while, let's say you send it monthly, it's going to start to feel like it's coming all the time, okay? Like, man, I'm getting stuff from these guys all the time. In reality, maybe it's only once a month. So they are, they're going to either start to tune it out or they may even do, I don't know if everybody else does this. I do this. I think a lot of people do this. I will delete my emails that I get from companies, not companies that I hate and I never want to hear from again, but ones that I look at and I think, yeah, you know, I really don't want to get this from them anymore. And about every month or two or something like that, I'll sit down for 15 or 20 minutes and I'll go through and I'll unsubscribe from a bunch of stuff just to sort of pull the weeds from the garden, so to speak. And a lot of those companies that I'm pulling out as weeds are not companies that I have any problem with. They're not companies that I dislike. They're just people that I don't really feel compelled to hear from on an ongoing basis. But on the mailing side of things, it's going to show up. And as long as it shows up consistently, you're going to remain in their face because what we're trying to do is we're trying to protect yourself from what I call the law of 9,344. The law of 9,344 simply states that people have at any given moment in time approximately 9,344 things on their mind, some of them very large and profound and important, and many of them very small and minor and mundane and unimportant, but they're all in there, okay? It could be as small as the warning signal that came up on my television warning me that the batteries in my remote control were going to go out soon. Well, this is not a major catastrophe. I do have batteries that I can replace them with. And even if I did, and I could probably withstand the pain and devastation of having to wait to use my remote control. I could probably even pilfer some batteries out of some other device. But it's on there, and it's things that I'm thinking about. And there's other things that are bigger and more important. And my daughter is heading off to college, and my son is in college, and you know, just all these things that are bigger and uh, uh, take more of your attention. And the point of all of that discussion is simply this. You've got to understand that that's what people are up against, and that's what people are thinking about, and, and, and they're just not putting time and attention into you in your company, in your offering. It's not important to them. So what you want to do is at least keep it on the radar. If it's 9,344, if you can at least be 9,342 or 3 on their list instead of off the list, then that's good, okay? So I recommend sending mail at least once per quarter. You can send seasonal offers if that's appropriate, special offers for deals and discounts that you might make available to this particular group of people, i.e. past customers, check mailers, voucher mailers. One of the most effective check mailers that I've seen is executed by a window company. It's a pretty large window company, um, multiple states. I think they're in the neighborhood of 40 or $50 million in sales. So by window company standards, very large. 
but they did something that's very interesting. I helped them execute this. They took this check mailer idea and instead of just sending a generic check mailer, they actually went back and they looked at the customer's purchase history and they took the amount that they had bought and they gave them a percentage of it. I believe it was 8%. And they took an 8% of that purchase and they did a mail merge and they created check vouchers that were worth 8% of what they had spent with them before good towards any other future upcoming projects. Okay. Now there are a few disclaimers on that. There had to be a minimum price you know, on the purchase. They couldn't take a $587 check and, and just buy $587 for the stuff and get it for free. But it was very compelling because the check was an odd amount. It came in at $817.26 or whatever 10% happened to be. And it had a headline that said something to the effect of, we're giving you a rebate of 8% of your purchase price with us that you can spend on future um, things. And it was extraordinarily effective, extremely effective. They sent this out actually in December with a deadline of December 31st. Uh, you know, I had to do this before the end of the year. And they had their biggest December in a decade using that promotion. And uh, I've actually lost track of the company. I don't know if they're still using it. Seems like the kind of thing you might go back to once again. You can also send out referral requests, updates on new things or different things that you sell, info that's germane to whatever you sell, okay? Or just, hey, we, we miss you and appreciate you. Just letting them know your business is uh, important to us. Now, it says here, Rich's opinion in newsletters. My opinion in newsletters is is a little bit schizophrenic because I don't really like them. I think most people don't read them. And the reason they don't read them is because the type of information that people put into these kinds of newsletters, for, particularly I'm talking about home improvement companies, is stuff that people really don't give much of a rat's butt about. Okay? It's the same reason that it's difficult for remodeling companies to have an ongoing, interesting Facebook or Twitter campaign because at some level, people just really don't care that much about siding. Okay? They just they don't. It's important to you, but it's not that important to them. But uh, I'll tell you the kind of newsletters that I do like the most. They're the ones that are more of a Reader's Digest type of content. Now, not exclusively Reader's Digest type content, but primarily. So there, there would be, if it were a four-page or an eight-page newsletter, there would be a few things in there that were specifically germane to that company or products or services, and certainly offers would be. Um, interesting and and uh, encouraged. However, if you want people to actually read it, you go more with the Reader's Digest type of a of a content. So, jokes, interesting stories, human interest stuff, anecdotes. You know the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Then people get it and they see it and they go, "Oh, okay, I know that there's some interesting stuff in here." But you know what? Even those types of newsletters really are losing their pull because that type of information that used to be interesting in Reader's Digest and so forth, it, it's available in people's hand every day because it's on their Facebook feed and it's in their social media and it's on their Yahoo News and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I'm more interested on these mailers of just saying, hey, we miss you. We want to do business with you. Do you have any referrals for us? Here's something new that we have. Hey, here's an offer for you. Here's a check for you, whatever, okay? So let me show you an example of this. This is for Castro Roofing, and it says fried egg logo goes here. That looks kind of funny, but that's just a little joke between me and Rudy, the, the owner of Castro Roofing, because their logo looks kind of like a fried egg. Now, if you don't believe me, just look up their website. But anyway... Here's what it says from the desk of Rudy Rodriguez. Dear Dave, as you probably noticed, I've sent you a $500 gift card for Castro Roofing. You can use it in lieu of payment next time you have a repair. No minimums required. I'm sending it to you for two reasons. Now, I should hasten to add, this is a commercial roofing customer of ours, and they send out, uh, and they, they work with companies 
so they're going to have multiple roofing jobs that they're going to need over the lifetime of doing business with that customer, okay? The first reason to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to complete your roofing project. We appreciate your confidence in us and hope you feel like we did a great job. I know there are plenty of companies out there to choose from. Thank you for choosing Castro Roofing. The second reason I'm sending this gift card is to thank you in advance for helping us get the word out about Castro Roofing. I'm hoping that your experience with us has been good enough that you feel comfortable recommending us to colleagues and associates who may have a need for commercial roofing services. I also know from experience that not everybody is comfortable hitting their friends up for business. So I know I fit into that category. That's why I'd like to make it easy for both you and your associates to find out about our services. If you know anyone who, underline, might be interested, we would be happy to send them an information package. You can have them requested at our website, or if you prefer, you can send us their name and we'll send them the following. Our Code of Ethics and Competency Contractor Standards Guide, our by board guide to replacing roofing. That's a particular guide that was put together for them specifically. And a $500 gift card for Castro Roofing that they can use towards any repair. As you know, we always strive to exceed customer expectations and any person you refer to us would be treated with the same level of respect as we have treated you. Now that's not an empty promise if the company, and in this case Castro Roofing, actually um, has outstanding service and treats people with respect, which they do. Okay. Thanks again for the opportunity to serve you. Sincerely, Rudy Rodriguez. P.S. You don't have to send us referrals to so utilize this gift card. It's our gift to you as our way of saying thank you. Okay. Here's another version of this. Dear Dave, as you notice, I've sent you a $500 check out made, to, made out to your district's general scholarship fund. This would be for a school district. I'm sure you can find a deserving student who would appreciate the award. I'm sending it to you for two reasons. The first is to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to complete your roofing project. Now, before you have a, a fit and say, well, that's a $500 check, and by the way, that's a real check, I understand this is the kind of company that's doing half a million to $10 million projects, okay? The average job for some of these re-roofing projects is in the two to three to $4 million range, okay? The first reason is to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to complete the roofing project. We appreciate, and again, it's the same letter but it just has a different um, incentive at the top. And all we're trying to do is just get in front of people and make sure that they see us and that they appreciate us. I mean, if you send a check for $500 made out to the scholarship fund, that's pretty cool. People are going to take that and they're going to be interested in it. Now, take a look at what you do in your business and think about the following questions. Number one, how much money are you willing to spend with this type of a gifting program, okay? In the letter on the left where they're giving a $500 gift card for Castro Roofing, the net hard cost on that is going to be somewhere in the range of $250, just assuming a 50% markup or margin, 100% markup, 50% margin, okay? The one on the right is going to cost a $500. It's a $500 check. And you can make that decision yourself by simply looking at the amount of your sale with this customer, the amount of margin with this customer, the ongoing possibility of getting more business with this customer and or getting referrals from this customer. So all of those things need to be taken into account and a dollar figure can be created. It doesn't really matter to me what it is. It just needs to be something that makes sense for your numbers and is sufficiently interesting and large enough to the recipient to where they don't look at it and say, well, that's dumb. If the roofing job was $1.5 million and you send them a $10 gift card for Castro Roofing, good towards any repairs, that's kind of probably pretty stupid, okay? See what I'm saying? So just think through this and, uh, you know, see what you can do. Let's go on. Next examples. This is from a company called Gugger or Googler, as you may, special customer appreciation summer sale, a full 20% off any purchase of windows or doors, plus two free gifts worth $1,560. You'll also see on the right-hand side, we've got the same offer for Dilworth, but it's a $960 offer. And let me read uh, one of these to you. I'll read the one on the right to you. Excuse me, the one on the left. Let's face it, when the summer months roll around, most people are not thinking about home improvement projects. They're thinking about vacation, family reunions, and the cabin at the lake. 
This means during June, July, and August, our sales teams are usually only running about half capacity. In the fall, our installation crews slow down quite a bit. As you can imagine, we'd like to keep our people as busy as possible. And the one on the right is the same type of thing, but it's talking about December and holidays instead of summer. Okay, So you use the same type of approach, just for different situations. I told my management staff, let's give our customers a great deal, keep our staff busy, and make everyone happy. Translation, win-win. And then it goes through and talks about in a normal year that they'd only sell you know, five jobs in June or in December, as the case may be, and it goes on to give an offer. So what we're doing is we're putting a rationale here of why we're giving you this offer. You're our customer. We'd like to give this offer to you. If you take action now, we'll give you some additional bonuses. And it becomes interesting, and it becomes um, compelling. Okay? Now, here's my really quick, um, I don't know, diatribe on this. I've used this type of letter a lot of times with different home improvement companies, and I have found that its effectiveness is directly proportional to how much your customers like you, okay, which is probably not that surprising, but I want you to understand if you've got customers that really don't like you that much for whatever reason, these types of letters aren't going to tend to work very well. So I guess you could say if we reverse engineer this, the number one um, element of getting more business from your customers is to have your customers have a good experience in the first place. Probably goes without saying. But this can be subtle sometimes. I'll give you an example. We used a similar letter to the one on the right. In fact, I remember we used it at the exact same time. The first time we used this letter on the right was Dilworth, and we also used it with another company that sold home improvements. We did it at the exact same time. We sent out a bunch of letters to one and a bunch of letters to the other. Okay, now the one from Dilworth got a, a very healthy response. It made money for them. The other company got very little response and it lost money for them. The reason was that the other company, it's not that they were jerks, not that their customers hated them, but they specialized in selling low monthly payment offers at, generally speaking, pretty high interest rates to customers who were lower income and couldn't afford without that kind of special financing. And as a result, their customers, while grateful to have the home improvements, it just really was a more, let's just say, uncomfortable selling process. A little bit more high pressure and so forth. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, let's talk about the annual gift. The annual gift, this is just another thing you can consider. Consider sending a gift to your big ticket customers periodically, and I would recommend that you build the cost into your sales cost. Okay? So if you spend $25 a year for a gift and you send it for five years, that's going to cost $125. Or you can just allocate the gift cost to marketing expenses. Either way, here's what you might do. If you sell a swimming pool that's $60,000, and you've got $25,000 margin in that pool, and that's gross margin. That doesn't cover your advertising and your electricity and all that stuff. But it's $25,000 margin. Allocate $250 to a 10-year gift program. That's $25 per year. Put it in an actual escrow account so that the money's set aside and it's there for that particular use. I'm a big believer in escrow accounts, taking money, setting it aside for something else in a different account. I mean, in our account, in our uh, business, we've got all kinds of different accounts for this, that, and the other, okay? And then once a year, send the gift. Now, it'd be fun to send it every year on the anniversary of that client's purchase, but that becomes very cumbersome after a while when you've got 500 different customers with 322 different anniversary dates. So it probably is easier just to spend the money once a year and send it out annually at the same time to everybody, or maybe twice a year based on relative proximity to their original purchase date. So send the, send the gift. What kinds of things could you send? Well, I would recommend sending things that go well with pools. That seems to make sense. Now, we might be looking at this thinking, wow, I'm going to spend $250 over the course of 10 years for people that probably aren't even going to buy a pool again from me. But again, if there's a $25,000 margin, okay, 
and they have the ability to buy another pool when they buy to move to their next house, or more importantly, refer me to their friends. Okay, guess what? Pools are a very social kind of a thing, right? So you've got this pool, and now we've got the neighbor kids over, and we've got the church group over, and we've got the Cub Scouts over, and we've got the soccer team over for their end-of-the-year party and all these different things. And we've got the ability to make referrals, and this is a good way to keep people at the – keep yourself at the forefront of people's minds. So one year you might send a couple of floaties you know, the kind that uh, you blow up and maybe they've got the company name on them or something like that. The next year you might send some monogrammed beach towels, you know, that they could use as they lay out. The, the next year maybe you could send some of those those floating squirt things that kind of have a pump action to them. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. I have a pool, so we go through, go through those things like they're going out of style. Maybe you could send a pair of sunglasses or some sunscreen. You know, anything that has to do with the pool. And you say, well, we, you know, it's not a swimming pool. We, we sold siding. Okay, maybe siding is a little bit harder to come up with something that's related to the siding. But it doesn't have to be something directly related. It could be a, a $20 gift card to uh, Chili's. And you send it, you know, with the postage and the card and thank you. Maybe all of that, the, the labor involved with getting it all together is $25 with your $20 gift card. Okay, you get an idea of what I'm talking about? And you just say thank you. I mean, imagine this. I'm sitting here in my house. I had a custom pool built by uh, a company called Claffy Pools. And uh, I'm now in this house on year 10. This is the 10th year. I've, I've been in here for 10 full years, going on 11, I guess. If that company had been sending me something, anything, for the last 10 years, I can't even quantify how impressive that would be. Think about it for just a minute. Now, this takes time and effort and attention and money, certainly. But the money part can be worked out, I think, pretty easily by just taking it and uh, allocating it. Now, if your company's you know, sort of behind the eight ball and perpetually behind on your bills and stuff like that, then that gets harder. But if you're in a decent, reasonably healthy cash position in your company, then it's something that can be done. And I'd recommend it, okay? Ongoing possibilities. The number one reason customers don't come back is what? You know what it is? Now, this is sort of anecdotal. I don't know if it's really 100% true or not, but they say that the number one reason customers don't come back is because of perceived indifference. In other words, I don't perceive that this company really cares about me that much. And uh, if that's true, then the number one thing to do is to is to uh, care more about them. But uh, the reality is the number one reason that people don't come back is simply because nobody asked them to come back, okay, which is part of perceived indifference. Okay, so you walk into a restaurant, you sit down, you have a meal, it's enjoyable, the waiter is, is friendly, and it was a pleasant experience, and the prices were reasonable. Great. They just assume that it was good enough that you're going to come back. And they might be right, but you know what? They also might be wrong, okay? So what we want to do is capture customer information. I wrote a, a newsletter article or blog posting about this last week. I talked about um, the starving artist, and I talked about a restaurant called Planet Burrito and how these guys just never ask for names. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do is to capture names of people that you come in contact with, okay, whether they become customers or not, if you can capture names, especially if you're in a home show or any other kind of show environment, getting in front of these people and uh, actually capturing their information so that you can now proactively market to them, okay? Let's see where we're at here. All right, let me give you a formula for doing this. First, capture the name and address of all your Customer second, contact them and ask them for more business. Third, make them a special offer and offer them a gift when you ask for more business. Pretty simple stuff. So let's go through this in a little more detail. And uh, this may be a little more applicable to a retail type uh, environment, but you know, bear with me. Let's go through it. Print up some professional looking cards. 
with a space for people to put their name and address, email, things like that. At the top, grand prize eligibility card or something similar. This, is, of course, is something that you could do at a home show or an event if you are a remodeler. Now, this is for a golf company, okay, the golf course. After the golfer is paid, but not yet, let the clubhouse for the course have the cashier hand each person one of the cards to fill out. Don't have a big stack of them sitting there so it looks like any schlep can fill it out as many times as they want. Have the cashier pull it out from behind the counter. Now, that's going to require some cooperation. The cashier then will tell the golfers that your golf course is giving away a complete round of golf for four, including range balls, cart rentals, unlimited 19th hole drinks, and snacks. The cashier should tell the golfers they have one drawing per week, and they're an average of 100 to 200 cards per week, so the chances are actually pretty good that you might win. And then the cashier limits registration to one card per person in the golfing party. The cashier would then tell them that the winner would be notified by email. Okay, That gives them incentive to actually give a real email address. What you do then is you pick a winning card every week and email the winner to inform them of their good fortune. That's the obvious part. Then you send an email to everyone else who entered the contest that week with an email that says, congratulations, you've won the weekly drawing from River Bend Golf Course. Immediately, this is going to interrupt and engage the person. Why? Because they know recently, within the last week, that they were there, they filled out the card, now they're seeing that they have won. Their brain will immediately attach these two things, filling out the card and receiving the email that says that they won. Okay? You might think that this will get lost in the shuffle of email, but trust me, they're going to see it to a large extent. Okay? So they're going to see the words Riverbend Golf Course Weekly Drawing. It's going to be familiar. They're going to recall it. Here's what the email says. Dear Larry, my name is Bob Jones, owner of Riverbend Golf Course. I'd like to thank you for entering our drawing for a complete round of golf for four with all the goodies that go with it. Jack Stevens of Smithville won the prize. As you can imagine, he's pretty excited. I'm sorry he did not win the first prize. But here's the good news. You won a valuable second prize. If you'll print out this email and bring it the next time you come, I'll present you with two large buckets of range balls, and your cart rental will be free for you and your guests. Congratulations on your prize. We hope to see you soon. Sincerely, Bob Jones. If yes, your prize is good anytime in the next month. You don't need to call ahead, but please remember to bring a copy of this email. Thanks again. And all we're doing is we're, we're asking them to come back in an interesting, engaging way that is better than simply saying, hey, come back, or hey, here's a coupon. I'm not saying don't send a coupon or that can't be effective. I'm saying this is a way that's interesting and engaging with the customers, okay? After the initial letter goes out, put them into a standard email or mailing offer like we just talked about with the special offers, the re referral requests, updates, hey, we miss you. This is the same stuff that we already talked about earlier. So the initial letter is really just to get them back in. My feeling is this, particularly with new customers, if you get somebody into a restaurant for the first time, you get them to your golf course for the first time, you get them out to your facility for the first time, the real key is to get them back for the second time. Okay, Time number two is where you're going to make it or break it in many cases. Okay. Now, let's talk about operation recovery. This is the third thing that was on our list. We're talking about situations where people have been buying from you, but then they stop buying from you, okay? All right, so let's go through this. First of all, you got to figure out why they're frustrated and why they left, okay? If there's a systematic problem or a systemic problem with your company, then send a letter or call them and tell them that you used to suck, but now you're better. This can be very, very disarming. Now, this requires a certain level of honesty, right? Saying, hey, we get it. We suck. That's why you left. We know it. If you do something new and better and different than in the past, let them know what that is. Admit your faults. Take action to overcome the problems. Now, again, this takes a little bit of soul searching, and it's a little bit hard to do. Sometimes it takes money to fix things, and that might be money that you don't really have. But I'm encouraging you to look at this fix the problems. What were the problems and the frustrations, okay? Look, hey, let's just have a real honest discussion right now, okay? Being in business is hard. Being a small business owner is hard. There's a constant juggle of revenue coming in and expenses going out and trying to service the business that you've sold. Everybody understands that. Everybody gets that. If you're a remodeler, you know exactly what I'm saying. On the one hand, you've got your salespeople out there selling, selling, selling. On the other hand, you've got your production crews trying to install it. And it's not always easy to get these things right. 
okay? Sometimes it's hard to install things in a timely fashion with the right people to do a good job and you're just trying to get by and you've got your best crew working over there, but in, in order to at least get something done on this job over here, you've got your guy who's not quite as good and he doesn't do as good of a job. And the cynic would say, well, just have the other guy do it who's good, but then you've got timing issues and people start to get angry. I mean, I'm just acknowledging that being in business is hard, okay? This is called real life. I know. I have a small business. It's hard. You juggle these things. And I'm encouraging you to continue to identify the areas where you're weak so that they can be fixed. Sometimes this can be a discouraging process. Sometimes you feel like no matter how much you do and how much you shore it up, you put one, a finger in one hole in the dike and another one pops out. I mean, this is called life, right? This is nothing new. Look at your personal life. Look at your relationship with your kids and with your spouse and with your business and with your finances and with everything. I mean, this is how life works, right? It's a continual process of plugging the dice. All I'm trying to do is give you a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel that says, you know what, you can weather the storms and you can identify the areas where you're weak and you can make them stronger. If there's 10 areas where you're weak and you shore up one of them, guess what? Now there's only nine areas where you're weak. And one of those other nine areas might start to pop a leak. It might start to cause your problems and you need to go over and fix that one. And now you've only got eight. But maybe another one pops up, so you're back to nine. I understand that. And I hope you understand that. I'm encouraging you to identify those areas and make efforts to fix them. Fix the biggest problems first, and then you can start to fine tune from there. And if you'll do this, you can actually go back to your customers who you've perhaps alienated or who perhaps are even angry with you, and you can just tell them, look, we know that we've messed up. It's very, very disarming. Think about your interpersonal relationships. When you've gotten into arguments, when things have gone wrong, and when one person has been big enough to come to the other and say, you know what, I messed up. You know what, you're right. I, was, I treated you terribly. I can't believe I did that but I, here's what I've done to fix it. Here's what I've done to make it right. Here's how I'm doing things differently in the future. And people are pretty open to that generally, okay? Run your numbers and on a recovery marketing program and let it rip. So figure out the annual value of a lost customer. Figure out how much it's going to cost to market to them annually. And run your numbers. If you got a $380 annual gross profit for a customer, Maybe this is a, a restaurant or a, a haircut salon or a, you know, whatever. And the recovery marketing program is going to cost you $15. Well, if you recover one out of 10, then it's going to cost you $150 to acquire $380 of your gross profit. That's probably a pretty good deal for you. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and actually call people. It's very disarming over the phone to admit that you've had a problem and that you've fixed it and to ask for their business again. This assumes that people actually, that you actually know who these people are, right? Grab it like, grab on like a bulldog and don't let go, okay? So let's see here. Hey, we know we sucked. If that's true, maybe you could send customer testimonials to show that you don't suck anymore information about new products. You could also ask for referrals, information germane to your topic. Hey, we missed you. These are the same kinds of things we talked about earlier. Okay, I'm going to just go through one more thing. There's a few things on here that we're not going to talk about just for sake of time. But uh, let's talk about keeping current customers coming back real quick, okay? And we've got a few things here. One is frequency programs, making rewards obtainable Okay. Everybody knows what a frequency program is. A frequency program is not the right strategy for every kind of company on the planet. So I'm not saying, hey, do all of these things. I'm saying here's some ideas for you to think about. Making rewards obtainable is one thing that's important. You don't want to give people rewards that are so small and, and, and insignificant that they don't feel like they have any chance of getting anything cool or worthy or interesting or worthwhile. Okay. Also make it easy to keep track of. You know, I get my hair cut at, at the same place every time. My, my sons get their hair cut there every time. I mean, we've been going there for, I think, eight or nine years, ever since the place opened. 
and they give you these little cards and they punch. And if you get, I think, six haircuts, then you get one for half price. And, you know, I cannot keep track of those things to save my life. And I've got probably 10 or 15 of these cards laying around. Some of them are in my car. Some of them are in my closet. Some of them get thrown away. Some of them go through the washing machine. They get one or two punches. Some of them get three or four punches. And you think, well, okay, so what? I'm going to tell you what. Here's the what. Every time they go to get my hair cut there and I go to pay, I start thinking about all these punch cards that I have that I can't keep track of, and it, it's it's a negative thing. You might say, well, you keep going back, so it must not be that big of a deal. And, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but you know what? I'm just like everybody else on the face of the planet Earth. I'll keep going to that place, and I'll keep going to that place, and I'll keep going to that place, and I'll keep going to that place. But as soon as something different or better or more convenient or a little bit better or a little bit more respectful, a little bit easier to keep track of comes up, I might just switch, okay? And for my family, I get my hair cut every single month. My sons get their hair cut about every two months. I've actually got three sons at home, so that's, let's see, six times three is 18 plus 12 is 30 haircuts a year. 30 haircuts a year times $20. It's a $600 customer, and they're playing with fire. I'm telling you, they're playing with fire. So just something to keep in mind, okay? Club memberships, value-add strategy to make business doing with you more appealing. If you do business with us, we'll give you this card that will give you these discounts at these following places or to give you these free things at these following places. This is covered in the Monopolize the Marketplace book in a fair amount of detail. Okay, so you might want to check that out. Keep it simple, relevant, and interesting. Value should be real, not fake but. I hate fake but value. Hey, we've got this card worth thousands of dollars in discounts, and you look at it as a bunch of crap that you would never use and stupid, and it's got so many strings attached to it. So if you do a club membership, and again, you may want to review the Monopolize Your Marketplace book. I don't know exactly where it's at in there. Somewhere in the last 40% of the book, it talks about uh, a carpet store, a flooring store that put together a club membership for designers. And uh, you might just think about that a little bit, okay? Free loss leaders, similar to annual gifting strategies where you uh, send out gifts to your customers. And this is pretty similar to what we talked about earlier where we send out the gifts and we say, hey, we appreciate your business. So that's what I have for you today on this. If you've got any questions or you'd like to make a comment, you can uh, either raise your hand and I'll call on you or you can fill out the uh, – question thing on your your uh, uh, console there. Let me see. I've got a question here. What is, it a, what is a good approach to use with families who have purchased a home where you have performed significant improvements possibly years ago? I've had family connecting, trouble connecting with these families as though they don't want anything to do with contractors that previously work on some aspect of their home. Um, well, let me give you a couple thoughts on that, Alex. The first thing you might want to do is uh, you know, th what I'm about to say is something that you may not be able to do for past customers, but something you might want to think about moving forward. Then I'll move to things that are a little bit easier and possible. You may want to photo document pretty much every job you ever do. Okay, Make it a part of your um, file on that customer. Because how interesting would it be if somebody moves into a new home, you go to them and you say, hey, we'd like to do some work for you, and here's the work that we've done before, and you show them the photo documentation of the work that's been done previously. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be kind of weird. Not weird in a weird, bad, creepy, stalker way, but in a sort of interesting, intriguing way when they can see their home that they now live in, but clearly at a time prior to their occupation of that home and they can see the work and it looks good and it's, you know, clean and clear and new and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I see that you use those. So there's one thing you might want to do. The other thing you might want to do is understand the reason why people may not be open to that discussion. And a lot of times it may not have that much to do with you and your company per se, but it may just have to do with timing, okay? So let's say that your name is Alex Walter and you're going to try to go get some business from 
a homeowner, and let's say that the uh, homeowner, let, let's just say it's any, just pick any random home in the neighborhood that you would like to serve. So it's a good prospect for you in terms of neighborhood and income and all that kind of stuff. But it's just a random home. So you go and knock on their door. Well, the problem that you're generally going to have is that if you randomly solicit somebody for business, the services that you offer are not that high on their list of 9,344 things. They're just not. Because the fact is, at this specific moment in time, a very small percentage of people in the community are thinking about buying what you sell at all. The fact that they used to the, the person that used to live there was your customer isn't that relevant when I don't really need what you're selling. You understand? And that would be true also for somebody who lives in a home where you hadn't done work before. In other words, out of 100% of people in your demographic, geographic area that you're trying to service, there might be only one, two, three, four percent that are thinking seriously or even semi or even casually about buying what you sell. And if you tap into one of the 95 or 6 or 7 percent that are not, their reaction to you is not necessarily going to be negative, but it's going to be standoffish and dismissive. And the reason is because I don't need what you sell right now. So the answer to that becomes frequency, okay? And that's really the key to this whole thing that we were talking about in terms of hitting them with the quarterly mailers. So you may want to put together a series of mailers for people that live in houses where you used to service that are a little bit generic. In other words, hey, we've done business in the home. We've done business in your home before you move there without being specific about the address or the type of work because then you could put a campaign together that lots of people that fit that category start getting them every month or every other month or every quarter. And you wait for them. See, this is the thing that nobody understands in marketing. They, they feel like if we send out enough mail or if we have enough advertising, that it's going to cause people to want to do stuff that they currently were not thinking about. And there is some truth to that. But the reality is it's still not really even true because what you've only really done and accomplished is you've taken people that were sort of getting close to thinking about doing what you're talking about and you're pushing them over the edge. So that's good. That's positive. I'm not saying it's not uh, worthy and likely that that can happen. But what I am saying is that typically some sort of outside force that is outside of your control and outside of your boundaries of what you have any kind of influence on affects people to make them want to buy what you sell. Okay? You can come talk to me about buying a new car all day long, but if I just bought a new car, I don't want to hear the discussion because I don't need a new car. But then if my son turns 16, then I might be interested in a car. Or if I have a wreck. Or if I go to my friend's house and he's got a cooler car than me and I think, wow, that's kind of cool. Maybe I need to get a car like that. Now I'm interested. But see, all these incidences are external to your marketing. And your marketing shows up consistently because what we're trying to do is make sure that when – they have that incident in their life that occurs. We want to make sure that we're on the radar when the pain finally happens. Okay. All right. So that's just some quick ideas for you. Um, any other questions? Thanks, Alex, for participating. I uh, appreciate being not only a customer, but uh, participating on the call. It's interesting and it's fun. Anybody else? If you don't have anything else, then we'll go ahead and end for the day. Going once, going twice. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And uh, I will be back again next week. We're going to have a customer business, excuse me, a contractor business accelerator call. We're going to talk about explainer videos. And I know I've talked about this before, but we've got more samples now and more things that I could show you. And just want to help you see how cool and useful these things really are. So we'll be back with you next week. Uh, and in the meanwhile, happy marketing. We'll see you later. Bye now.